Welcome to To The Point and happy holidays. As we enter into a new year, there is a new era in Lansing. And to discuss that this morning, newly reelected State Senator Mark Heisinger from now representing both Kent and Ottawa counties in your new district. Congratulations on what was a tough election and um, a win. You were able to prevail, but some of your other colleagues weren't. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But we were discussing just before we started this recording that your history in running for state political office has been practically an election a year because you ran in 2018 a primary and a general, 20 primary and a general. Now you're running during a pandemic. Um, then special election when Senator McGregor left for county government, primary, general, and now a re-election. And you make the point that because of the new absentee voting laws, it's like nonstop. You're running multiple elections within a cycle. Yeah, that's right. Anytime you've got an election now with a primary, you're basically running four elections because you've got the, the absentee ballots going out early June, and then you've got the, the primary in August. Uh, you've got the absentee ballots coming out in September, and then you've got the November election. So a lot of things happen during those time frames, and uh, you can ask my family. It's been a fairly relentless uh, several years here, uh, but uh, we've got uh, four now, so we're excited about a little bit of reprieve there. Well, you, you know, it's, it's a big job anyway because um, serving in the legislature, and I was reminded as I was listening to farewell speeches, is a really time-consuming thing. It's not, you know, people say, oh, they're only in Lansing three days a week. Well, that's sometimes true, but the fact of the matter is you're always on and your phone is always there. And so even though you don't have an election, it's still going to be a busy four years, but at least for a little while you can step back and not worry about the election process. Let's talk about this session. We can talk about House and Senate um, over these past few years because we're moving into a new dynamic that we will discuss. But... There were so many moving pieces. One of the big conversations during the last few years has been about the response to the pandemic. And obviously the legislature and the governor uh, locked horns a lot of times. And it's hard to know in the moment because everybody was doing this without a handbook. Um, and hindsight is always 2020. But given where we are and stipulating that COVID is still with us, but not in the same kind of way it was, did... Did the state on balance get it right? I mean, I, I know there are things that happened that you wouldn't have liked and probably everybody would have a different take, but did, did the state government largely get that pandemic response right? You know, Rick, it's a tough one because what is right and what is good? That's right. uh, and it all depends. And you, will, you compare from state to state how people responded, what kind of things happened. Uh, that's really water under the bridge. But now we're stuck with what's the response? And uh, we can, in fact, take an evidence-based response to that. So education, for example, is a great, great area we look at. We know that we saw uh, students not in classrooms for an extended period of time, uh, some of our districts for an incredibly long amount of time. Uh, consequently, we've seen learning loss. We see learning loss both in the uh, reading as well as mathematics area, um, with, with mathematics being worse. Um, obviously, as a, as a kid, you can still pick up a book and read it. Uh, I doubt many kids pick up a book and say, hey, I'm going to do some algebra problems. So the response from the legislature has been, how do we backfill that, make sure that we have resources that we can apply to help them with tutoring, with extra programs, make sure there's dollars for that. And that's the part that I think the state, we know that we're getting that right because we can improve things there. Well, let's talk about that because as an appropriator, you were part of a really big budget and the biggest ever. Uh, school aid fund that has been turned out. Uh, that was the result of a lot of things. I mean, there was some one-time money that you could spend from the Fed. Uh, revenues for the state were up. Uh, and I was the, the guy who had said early on in the pandemic, watch out, there's a cliff coming because yeah. the revenues are going to drop off because so many businesses will either be closed permanently or for long periods of time. That never developed. In fact, the revenues started going up within months. So did the state with that response do what they could to kind of make up for things like learning loss because i know there's some things in that that school aid fund that deal with that sure i mean that's all part of it and it's it's never really one thing when you look at the headley amendment when that first came out we saw a disparity in funding for districts across the state um 
You could compare East Grand Rapids and Rockford, two districts in our communities where we see uh, a disparity in funding. They're different, uh, but how do we then fix it? This, the, the legislature has been working on this for a long time, this 2x formula, how we can uh, add additional dollars to those on the bottom end uh, and yet still preserve those on the top end. That's a very long process. So for this year, for the first time, we could actually find parity and say, look, we're going to fund these things from the state at the same level, something that many people have wanted for a long time. And this is not a partisan issue. This is just one of those unintended consequences. And for, for the first time, we actually had the dollars to do that and say this is responsible. And to build it in the budget moving forward, I think that's really, I mean, if you want to try to find a, a good outcome from the pandemic, having those additional dollars available for education, that's really good governance, I think. Well, and that's also a promise that was 30 years in the making. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was supposed to happen way back yeah. when the school aid formula changed, and it never had until this time around. Uh, one of the things that, when you think about those extra funds and you think about the economy, and I want to talk a little bit more about the economy in the second half, but when you have all that extra money and you push it out the door to, and I'm not suggesting for a moment these aren't worthy mm -hmm. expenditures, but when you put that money out there and you say, we want to make up for time lost or we want to make up for promises made that haven't uh, come to fruition, and you can do that because you have some other disp uh, disposable cash, is that sustainable? If that cash, because clearly these revenues are not going to stay like they are. I mean, they never do. They change of one way or the other. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Is that a concern for you to sustain what you've tried to do? Well, and the dynamics of the budget are, are wild every year. You think you know what it's going to be, and then something happens. Never, and and no. that's always the case. Right. I don't care. For, for example, during the mid-2000s, uh, very good people kept saying, we think, you know, relief is just around the corner. Well, that turned out to be about a four-year yeah. corner. That then tomorrow never comes. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, and in this case, I think there's been some really incredible responsive, uh, responsible spending done for things that, uh, frankly, aren't very sexy. Things like uh, pension reform and being aggressive on pensions and paying those things down. Those are promises that were made by legislature decades ago. And to get those liabilities paid down in the long run, that's responsible not only because those obligations are there, but two, then the liability isn't there that we don't have to pay down in the future. So using those one-time funds for one-time things to help us catch up, that's actually a very good solution. Did it make it easier because as an appropriator, it's difficult when you don't have enough money to go around it. I've watched that process mm -hmm. and I've seen appropriators really struggle to try to get to priorities and still meet all of the obligations that are there right in front of them. On the other hand, when you've got a lot of money, everybody wants something. And so every member has a constituency who says, hey, you guys have a lot of extra money. Now is the time to take care of that special interest thing that we've wanted done. Again, not to suggest that special interest isn't important, but it seems like you're always going to have more ask than you have money to answer. Well, I think you're going to have more asks, and the ask will be much higher. Yeah. Uh, but having said that, I think that the the appropriations team has done an incredible job of being responsible with those dollars. That's why we see dollars still on the balance sheet, uh, because you just don't spend it. And being responsible with that money is incredibly important. But using those things for not just some floofy member uh, idea, uh, but using it towards things like the Greenway program downtown, putting it towards the outdoor amphitheater, that's really big. Uh, those are really cool things that build real communities that make our population uh, grow in the area. That, that make our communities better and stronger, and we talk about things like placemaking. Those are all tools that we use to make West Michigan more attractive. Uh, and why is that important? Because population growth is important to all these formulas. Uh, everything's built and predicated on some level of growth and being attractive because employers need em new employees. Um, the hotel and restaurant industry, uh, they had a very difficult time having people come back to our communities uh, to staff these facilities. It all works together. It's an ecosystem, and it's never just one aspect that people are challenged by. But when we think about the Appropriations Committee, uh, we, we all have many challenges. Uh, when I first got in the legislature, Rick, I had people come to me for a $500,000 ask, and that was a big dollar amount. Every once in a while, somebody come for a million, and there were a few and far between. 
Uh, in the past year and a half, I've had people come to me with six or seven hundred million dollar asks. That's unbelievable. And um, it's also that's the time when you have to be the adult in the room. And I was very honest with folks in saying, look, I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think it's good spending. We had our own filters and criteria to identify what was good spending. And many of those just frankly weren't. So uh, in some respects, it's easier to have less money. Uh, at the same time, when you're the adult in the room, you have to be responsible and say, I don't think this is such a good idea. Outgoing minority leader Senator Ananick uh, was on the show a few weeks ago, and he says part of the job, he was talking about leadership, but it goes to you as an appropriator, part of the job of an elected official is to say no. Yeah. And it's probably not the easy part of the job, but part of it is there. Uh, talk to me for just a little bit about a couple of other things that were in the budget. Uh, and they've been there for a while. Uh, but there's some money for job training and there's some money for things like uh, getting skills up to, to, you know, up to par, getting people with the skills they need for the jobs uh, that are out there right now. That's a process. That doesn't happen right away. And that's something that has been ongoing. Are you satisfied that the state's doing what it can? to help prepare that workforce that we know is badly needed. Yeah, and that's exactly right, because, you know, if you take a look at a program like Going Pro, which has been around for quite a number of years, mm -hmm. uh, great program, great outcomes, um, it's upskilling the employees that you already have, taking them to the next level. Why is this important? Because employee retention is tough, this economy and the market is tough in the job market, uh, so he hel helping those people retain their job is good, but giving them an upskill. Uh, results in compensation increases, but it makes it easier for employers to have less churn. And I've heard firsthand from both small employers and large employers the value of programs like Going Pro. That's why I've been proud to put uh, my name on the, the paper that says I support Going Pro and seeing significant increases in dollars there. We've got just a couple of seconds left in this uh, segment, but um, how long term is that? I mean, you can't just flip a switch and somebody's ready to go. Uh, but because it has been around for a while, are we starting to see the results from that? I think we are. And in fact, when I talked to a business owner uh, recently, small tool and die shop, they said, look, Mark, we've got to make sure these uh, going pro dollars are there. Our team gets new equipment in. It's sophisticated. Uh, places like Grand Rapids Community College help to do the training. So it's all these things that work together to provide tools for our employers. We've got a lot more to talk about, and we're going to do that, including the new makeup of the state Senate and what that's going to look like with a leader that you know very well. That's all next to the point. Welcome back to To The Point. My guest is Senator Mark Heising, and we're going to talk about the election in just a minute, but in the last segment I forgot uh, to talk about something that's happening in your district in economic development, and it was uh, $5.7 million for an expansion of a business in Walker, a city that uh, you were once mayor and a, a city commissioner on. Uh, tell me about that a little bit, because that uh, looks like it's going to generate not just more money into the community, but ongoing with more jobs. Yeah, not only is it more jobs, but it's a, it's a really high-tech factory. You know, uh, automation is going to be the future of everything. And uh, finding organizations that can help automate some of the mundane, relentless, uh, challenging projects for, for employees, uh, the, the monotonous, uh, heavy lifting, things like that, makes a better work environment for them. But it also helps employers with the talent gap that we have right now. So really proud to see that get over the finish line. Yeah, and if, if you haven't, uh, folks should drive out through Walker and take a look uh, from the new MSP headquarters to all of the development. I had not been out there for a while, and when we went out for, for the opening of the new MSP, it doesn't look like it used to. No, very many literally years. thousands of jobs have been added since uh, I was mayor that we worked hard. Uh, and economic development is not just giving money, but it's building infrastructure and setting the stage for future organizations to come there, making it attractive, and Walker continues to do an excellent job there. Well, let's talk about this last election. You sure. couldn't turn on any television station in West Michigan and not see commercials about the Senate race that you and State Representative David LeGrand were in. And it was a hard-fought election, as we pointed out at the top of the show. You prevailed, but some of your other colleagues did not, and that has changed for the first time in a long time. The balance of power in the state Senate. Now, it's been 12 years since Democrats were in charge over in the House. They had an eight-year period, or a four-year period where they were in charge um, in the 2000s. But it's been a long time since it's happened in the Senate. So... 40 years. That, yeah, that's going to be a big change. Uh, we know that uh, Senator Winnie Brinks from Grand Rapids, the Senate Majority Leader. So West Michigan has good representation. 
But how is that change going to impact you? Obviously, your side won't be setting the agenda um, anymore. Uh, but how do you think, not knowing having never served mm -hmm. in the minority in Lansing, um, how do you think it's going to impact you? Well, you know, Rick, I always think of myself as a pragmatist, as a centrist, somebody who can work with anybody to get things done. Uh, I'm actually really excited to work with Winnie, having uh, people from Kent County represent us and our values here. I think it's going to be great. I've always gotten along well with Winnie, as well as many of the Democrats. I think a lot of times uh, the public's view of how things work in Lansing is is misshapen uh, of things. So, for instance, this year in the doors, I heard people say things like, you should try to get along better in Lansing. Uh, you should work together more. You should be more bipartisan. Uh, and I said, well, the, the truth of the matter is if you look at the journal and see once how people have voted on these things, you'd find the vast majority of all bills are passed in a bipartisan fashion. And that process is because during the committees, uh, we work together to shape the bill so that it's going to be acceptable so they can get over the finish line. Um, I'll work with Winnie or anybody else to get things done for West Michigan, standing up for good values and making Michigan a better state and making Kent County better. That's our job. And now I include Ottawa County as well. Well, it's interesting you talk about representation for West Michigan because um, Speaker Tate is from Detroit, but the other three quadrant leaders are from the western side of the state with uh, incoming uh, Republican leader Hall uh, is from uh, the Kalamazoo area and the Senate uh, Republican leader um, is Senator Nesbitt, also from West Michigan. So there is good representation. And Democrats will have the gavels, but I was interested in, the, it's funny that you said that because my next question was this. During fa farewell speeches, as the lame duck session was wrapping up, you heard a lot of mem <coughs> pardon me, members stand up on both sides of the aisle and thank members of the opposite party. Mm -hmm. And when I put this question together, I said that's not always the perception in the public, right. so, and there was yeah. no prompting on your part. Um, but still, there are those moments, and uh, I will take my responsibility for being the guy that when somebody's giving one of those fiery speeches, um, be it uh, Senator Shirky or Senator Hertel, uh, those things tend to get on television mm -hmm. because yeah. it, it is something a little out of the norm. But Democrats are in an interesting situation. They've got one vote, essentially. So at some point, they're going to need Republicans because they won't be able to hold all the Democrats together. Same is true on both ends uh, of the chambers. Is that going to make the cooperation a little more necessary and perhaps a little easier? I think it'll probably make things better for all of us. Um, look, if you look at the, like it or not, when Bill Clinton was a president and we had divided government in Congress where they had the House and Senate, uh, good policy came through there because they were willing to work together. Uh, but we have to have a willing team. I think that uh, Winnie Brinks will be willing to work with us on things. Uh, Joe Tate, I've had the privilege of working with him on the appropriations side and other committees. He's a good man, a uh, trusted individual. Uh, but I think the rest of our people, between Eric uh, and Matt, that will be in good shape uh, while representing West Michigan. But I think our job is really to work as a team to get things done. One of the things that I wonder about, and, and it may or may not come up in the way I think it's going to, and I know there's already been some work uh, done on it. Uh, Senator Nesbitt was on the show a couple of weeks ago. Um, we talked about some changes in, in the funding of roads, and not just new roads, but road repair, which is ongoing. And one of the things I brought up to him, and I, I've been talking with members about, is is it time or is it going to become necessary perhaps in this term uh, for the legislature and the governor to take a look at doing something about the way we fund roads and to be sure the governor has talked about this since when she ran the first time but the reality is that if electric vehicles develop in the manner that manufacturers at least seem to think they are because they're shifting so much of their production to EVs, then that gas tax that the state has depended on for a long time is going to be a dwindling source of rev revenue. And as I say, I know that some changes have been made, but as an appropriator, again, I, I go into your mind of figures, and is that something you're going to have to look at? You know, some of that's already baked in, because mm -hmm. if you've got an electric vehicle or a high-performance hybrid vehicle, your registration costs more. Mm -hmm. Now, people will say, well, why would my registration cost more? Uh, because the other half of that comes from uh, internal combustion engines, uh, fuel tax. And so it's about double because the, uh, it, it evens itself out that way. That doesn't account for the fact that we have road inflation. We have a shortage of construction workers, materials are in shortage, uh, and they're getting more expensive. So uh, it's the age-old question in Michigan, how much more do we put in it? Um, and we'll have to find ways to be creative. And 
you know, we have more work to do with roads. Uh, it's, it's probably never going to go away. Um, I think that there's some different ideas from a construction standpoint, things that we can do. We've got a new transportation director, the new department head. I'm hopeful for some, uh, some help there. Uh, one of my biggest projects I've been working on for probably eight years is replacement of the Fruit Ridge Bridge. Uh, this you mentioned about the Northridge area. Uh, thousands of new jobs, and we've got a five-lane road that goes to a two-lane bridge. Uh, I'm not an engineer, but uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this is the narrow part of the hourglass. So more projects like that that we have to do to recognize that there's growth in West Michigan and Walker. Back to budgeting for a minute. Uh, we know that there's still surplus money out there. We know that some of that money will have to be spent. The federal government has some limitations on it and some limitations on how you can spend mm -hmm. it. Uh, but we also know that we still have inflationary pressures out there. And, and I should point out the White House, uh, the president was here in Michigan talking about things are getting better, pointing out some prices that are lower. I take no issue with that, except that they're still higher than they were a couple of years ago. People are fe still feeling a lot of pressure. Um, is, is the idea of some relief for Michigan taxpayers something that is going to be talked about, do you think, in this coming session? Well, I hope so. When we look at our tax system, if there's an opportunity for us to reduce uh, the tax burden for Michiganders, that's not only good for us right now, uh, giving some relief for inflationary perspectives, but also we have to use the lens of is it going to make Michigan more attractive for people to live here, uh, better for a place for business to do work here, uh, and all those things come down to taxes. And uh, we have certainly other states that are more attractive from Texas or Arizona or Florida. Uh, we have to compete with those. We saw a battery plant go to Tennessee, for instance. Uh, can't say it's just because of uh, tax rates, but we also have to use that as a tool to show that we are competitive. Do you have uh, trouble convincing some of your colleagues uh, to do things like put money out there for investment? In other words, trying to bring some money to the table to help entice some of these companies to move here when we know every other state does it? Yeah, you know, I served on the Economic Development Committee, and um, sometimes it meets with, with challenges. And uh, some folks that tend to be more uh, libertarian, if you will, that don't want to see government involved at all. Look, the reality is, is that other states do it, and we have to have some tools for it. But I think it's just as important or more important to create an ecosystem that says Michigan's doors are open. And that's what we did in Walk with Northridge. Uh, having site-ready specifics uh, is really important. I would love to see us put more money towards infrastructure for some of those sites so that when a business is doing a site selection committee, they can say, hey, the state of Michigan is ready, and let's be open and, and willing to take that. And talk a little bit about that. That's about having uh, curbs put in and having sites that are already ha have sewer and water and electricity and those things, so you don't have to start from zero. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the stuff you don't see. Right. Um, not only maybe you have water, but is there enough pressure for fire suppression? And we had that in Walker. What about what about conduits for opt fiber optics? Those are all important uh, tools that are needed. Uh, but on, it's never just one thing. It's about the education, the readiness. So that's why programs like Going Pro are important, funding things like community colleges are important for higher education. It's never one thing. It's all these that work together to create a great state. We're really considered a top 10 state for um, uh, economics, uh, for, for businesses that are seeking locations, uh, but we can always do better. Uh, we need to grow our population. Uh, this is uh, something that isn't there yet, but I've heard this conversation. Since we're talking about economic development, the vote on right to work a number of years ago, one of the most contentious I ever saw in Lansing. And I've heard some Democrats talk about now in the majority, they may try to do away with that. Without getting too deep into it, we only have about 45 seconds left. Um, is is that something that plays into economic development from your standpoint? I think absolutely. When we look at how site selectors look at Michigan, they weigh a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and right to work is probably one of those. And. Um, it, does it make us more attractive or less attractive? Those are the kind of lenses I use. And we want to do things that are going to make Michigan a more attractive place to do business, not put barriers in place. We want to create solutions and opportunities for all Michiganders. Senator, I told you we would close this show by looking at your priorities. And then I said, no, we probably won't because we'll run out of time and we've run out of time. But the good news is I'd like to have you come back and do that after the first of the year. Have a happy holiday and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Rick. We'll be right back with more To The Point in just a minute.